He's America working God. He's America working God. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is America working God. All right. Good morning, church family. And good morning, those of you on Facebook and YouTube. Hey, this is our first time on Facebook in a while. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe. Give me a victory in Jesus in the comments. You know, the reason why we do a victory in Jesus is because in order to get peace, you must first have victory. And if your victory is in Jesus, you're going to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. So this morning we're going to be talking about gentleness. Now gentleness or meekness, depending on the Bible translation, is a fruit of the Spirit. And as you mature as a Christian, will start to show in your life due to the Holy Spirit within you. The fruit of the Spirit are love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Rather than asserting superiority, someone who is gentle wants to help others, even when they have been done wrong. Gentleness in the Greek is pros, P-R-A-U-S, which is the Greek word for meekness, thus is an undertone for gentle strength. The word that is often missed in the translation. A lot of people miss the point that if you're gentle, a lot of times you're strong. Think about how many big giant people you hear are referred to as gentle giants. Gentleness in the Bible is strength under control. Like a mother taking care of a child. She uses all her strength to take care of her child, who relies on her, on a mother who could crush it, but rather loves that child, even to the point of self-sacrifice. 1 Thessalonians 2.7 says, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So with that being said, let, let, let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and had been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or in any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to entrust with the gospel, so we speak not to please man but to please God who test our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, being affectionately desired of you. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to you, to any of you, while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses of God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward 
you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in the manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The mother like a child, stop and think about Jesus and us. Jesus never used his power to defeat him or to, to defend himself, but he used it to defend the Father. Jesus' power was always there, and he was always in control. He only used it for God's purpose. Remember, Jesus did not defend himself when people were talking about him. He gave no answer to false accusations. Though he had all the power, he could have called a legion of angels. He showed us gentleness, meekness, strength under control. How much more effective could we be as Christians if we could learn not to engage in senseless arguments, not to fight with others when given a chance to show the love of God. Jesus did this best. Let's read John chapter 7, 53 through John 8, 11. We're going to talk about the lady caught in adultery. I do want to talk about this particular passage, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Um, in the King James, you won't see these notes, but in most Bibles, most modern Bibles, you'll see it. This passage was not found in their earliest manuscripts. However, it was probably a note that the teachers wrote in. Maybe it was a story that had been told about Jesus. Um, however, it has been taught in scriptures for years. They went each to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, before we go too deep into this, I kind of want to stop and point this out. In Jesus' handling of this, I, he's aware of the situation. They're trying to set him up to see if he's going to respond incorrectly. And at the same time, how many people does it take for adultery? That woman could not commit adultery by herself. So if one is going to be persecuted, the other guilty party should be also. They only brought the woman to him. It takes two. So so be aware of that in this situation. We always hear about the woman. Where's the man? I mean, are these guys even bringing up something truth? Or did they just yank some poor lady around and accuse her to see how, you know. We don't know the context there. But it does take two. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him. And he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now understand, it says that he threw... Or that he wrote on the ground, but it, it never says what. And really, I guess it's not that important. It could have been a message to them, or it could have been anything. Jesus showing that, hey, look, um, you know, yeah, you guys are, are trying to ca catch me off guard here, but I'm not that worried about it. I got 
bigger fish to fry, you know? Um, at once, more, at once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You know, Jesus reminded these people that they had a sin too. May he without sin throw the first stone. Not one of them could with a truthful heart say, I'm sinless. He reminded them of their guilt. And as Christians, every one of us have guilt. Jesus had all the power to use the law to persecute her, even to the point of death. And that reminds me of Paul. That's what Paul was doing to the church. He had all the power, according to the law and the permission from the from, from the Sanhedrin, to go and persecute the church. But Jesus, he didn't respond that way. He had the message of mercy, which would be forever lost. So he showed strength under control. He showed gentleness. He showed that mercy. Matthew 5.5 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are not these weak little people. They are people who are strong. And they are able to control that strength. If you are strong and you can't control your strength, you're just a nut. You're blowing up and you're making people scared for no reason. But if you're able to control your strength and, and know how to use that power, people's going to respect that. I heard about Mother Teresa being somebody that could walk into, walk into the United Nations type areas. And people would listen to her out of respect and reverence. A frail little old lady. But she had that strength. She stood for God. She did not bend. And she kept it under control. She didn't blow up when people started talking about her, arguing or trying to put her down. She stayed focused on the message. As Christians, we should be staying focused on the message. The message of the cross, the message of salvation, the message of forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Therefore, a prisoner, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Therefore, or I'm sorry, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Of all who is over all and through all and in all. Verse 7 and 8, I'm going to finish it. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave 
gifts to men. You know, I love this because it reminds us that we're doing this with humility and gentleness. We're called with patience to bear with one another. When I think of something bearing something, I think of a, like a load bearing wall in a building or a, a, a post holding up a roof. All that weight is on there. It's the, it, it, it's bearing it. That means there's pressure. It's not easy. That thing is, has to be strong to hold it up. And we're to bear with one another. That means every one of us has weaknesses. We all have things that might annoy one another, get on everybody's nerves. But if we can't bear it up, we're going to collapse under that weight. If we're bearing with one another in the Lord, we have the strength to do it, to show that love, to show that mercy, to encourage people. You're going to thrive as a church, as a person who is sharing their testimony, as someone walking in the Lord. Proverbs 15.1 A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Sometimes... To be gentle is the strongest response you could give. God has showed us in many ways that you can be gentle and not be a pushover, but be in control. Let God's gentleness guide you today. If you haven't started a relationship with Christ Jesus, Jesus paid the way. He died on the cross for your sins. John 3.36 says, If you believe in the Son, that's Jesus Christ, you shall have everlasting life. But if you believe not, God's wrath remains upon you. What does that mean? Well, the wages of sin is death. And it's not the kind of death where you close your eyes and life is over. It's a spiritual death, a separation from God for all eternity it's torturous no peace no comfort nothing but pain and torment that's hell and hell wasn't created for you it was created for the devil and his demons the Bible says that we all sin and we all fall short of God's glory but the gift of God through Christ Jesus is eternal life Jesus paid our way he's the only way to heaven if you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again in three days, that he paid for your sins on the cross at Calvary, he's the one and only Son of God, the Messiah, you're going to heaven. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I recommend you start a relationship with Christ Jesus today makes an eternity a difference. Be blessed.